our next speaker will be talking about his insights into the challenges of trying to change a dysfunctional local council. Stuart Burns, who's now retired, has had a diverse and highly successful career uh, in quite a number of areas, interestingly enough, in architecture, in investment banking, global IT management. I was a general manager, chief information officer for many high-profile international companies. He's also chaired boards and subcommittees. He was a bail justice in Victoria, similar to our special justices. Now, he did that job for 21 years and uh, eventually made a very smart move and relocated to here in South Australia. His specialization and expertise over the last 45 years have been rectifying major issues within large corporations, nonprofits, and state government organizations. Now, the last two government organizations that he uh, was brought in uh, where he was able to fix some serious problems were WorkSafe Victoria and the Transport Accident Commission, which was based in Geelong. Stewart now lives in Encounter Bay. Good choice. <laughs> He's married with three adult children. He's a local JP in Victor Harbor. He's active in a number of local area, community, and charity organizations. Please welcome Stuart Burns. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wrote out a speech, um, but I'm actually going to skip the first part that I was actually going to go through the recent um, council satisfaction survey. Uh, listening to the couple of the past speakers, I actually think it's important that people understand the Local Government Act. Um, it was designed for councils to adhere to, but it's got a major flaw in that it allows local councils to modify and change what the Act says to adopt their own policies and agendas internally. And the intent was that councils would be run by good people of good moral and ethical standards and do the right thing by the residents. Now, my experience in dealing with government organisations is that that's not always the case. Um, so I just wanted to... Quite often people will refer to say that well, the legislation says this, why doesn't the council do that? If they change their own policies and charters and frameworks, they, they can adopt within reason um, quite a, a gap between what the legislation says and what they pursue internally within the chamber. Doesn't mean it's right, but it's lawful. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, I, was, I don't belong to any group or team. I'm a concerned citizen. I got concerned when I moved here why the rates were double what I was paying in Melbourne. And when I was working in Sydney, it's double the I lived in the city. Um, it's very similar to what Burnside in Adelaide pays, except they've got 45,000 people. So the debt level's similar, the rates are, are similar. And I couldn't quite understand why uh, that was... So I've been doing some investigation. I will be going through based on my experience and expertise, where uh, councils have failed and what you need to do as residents to address that. Um, I haven't met the Mayor and I haven't met the CEO, but I've watched every council meeting I could get my hands on back to when they were actually first filmed. So I'm going by how they've conducted themselves, how they have acted, and taking that on board against the legislation, against behaviour of other organisations that I've been brought in to sort out. So, let me start. As of February 2022, the Australian Election Commission has listed that there are 13,103 people enrolled to vote in the forthcoming Victor Harbour Council elections. 
That number does not include the council's supplementary role for local businesses and non-resident ratepayers. That's people with holiday homes here who live in Adelaide or interstate, of which it's about 22% of the houses in, in Victor. The high number is, because of the recent state election, you're automatically enrolled um, on the council rolls to vote. The supplementary rolls are cleared January each year, so non-resident ratepayers and local businesses have to register every 12 months or else they don't get to vote in the council elections. But that 13,000 is people who are ratepayers who are not who are local who are entitled to vote. In the last council elections in 2018, there were 6,312 postal votes sent out to ratepayers. So now we're looking at almost double the amount. That, that number is actually really encouraging because if there's such a high level of resident dissatisfaction with council, then that satisfaction, dissatisfaction can be leveraged into votes. As I mentioned earlier, there will be council elections in November and an opportunity to install nine new councillors and a new mayor. So nominations for council start in 10 weeks, voting starts in 17 weeks' time. So what needs to be done in that time? Well, Victor Harbour has a lot of people who are quite upset with council and frustrated. There are resident advocacy groups in Victor Harbour, but they're fragmented. So what they need to do is use the next 10 weeks to remind all residents of Victor Harbour of the mistakes and debt levels of the current council. They need to organise to work together to consolidate individual candidates who are considered running for council into a viable team of candidates. Fragmented, they'll never get enough new councillors on to have enough votes on council to change anything. And you'll end up with another dysfunctional council for another four years. Even worse, you will potentially end up with significantly higher council debt levels, and I'll just take you through that. So currently the Victor Council, according to their financial uh, budget, um, and I don't know if it's been approved yet or not, is $16,508,312.13. Plus you've got legal liabilities from the asbestos issues at the Waste Management um, Authority. Now that, that figure, I believe, could potentially be higher because that's what's in the budget for this financial year. It's not including monies that have been rolled over to future budgets or have been put, uh, proportioned out into other budgets. If the current council's re-elected and all their proposed capital projects go ahead, and not saying they all, they all may, but if they did, Victor would be following, as Peter mentioned, uh, Alexandria's high debt levels, where you're going to have the majority of your revenue go on servicing debt rather than critical services that ratepayers want. And my feeling is that if Victor Harbour residents don't get the council right and the financial management done properly, you're going to end up not as high as um, Alexandria Council, but you know a similar situation. Their debt levels are approaching $92 million. Um, and that's from their own financial plan document. They hope to get that debt level down to $23.4 million by three, uh, 2031. The last thing that um, the resident um, groups need to do is to consolidate their campaign funds ahead of the August registration date so they have enough money to campaign properly and extensively. And you may ask why. Well, because a dysfunctional council or an organisation, it's no different from other government departments that I've seen, survives by isolating dissidents internally through code of conduct violations on councillors who speak out against council excesses, through overriding elected members in meetings who put forward a vote motion or request 
vote deferment until more information can be provided. Externally, they keep resident groups discouraged through despair and apathy that they're unable to change anything. They also ignore resident complaints and by keeping residents ill-informed about the true extent of council mistakes and debt levels. And that is a common approach of councils and government departments, um, not just here, but across Australia. So why haven't residents been able to change bad councils? Victor Harbour, like many other councils in the region, have had successive bad councils. Some have been sacked by the South Australian government. A lot of good people with the best of intentions have got themselves elected to council wanting to make a difference. Only to be overwhelmed by the complex council process, daunting legislative requirements that have to be adhered to, and a fundamental lack of knowledge about most matters brought before council for decision. And that is the key, is they lack a fundamental knowledge. And I've watched the videos, and a lot of people, councillors, are struggling to understand what the administration passes up them to make decisions on. They're not asking the right questions. They're not understanding um, the full cost implications. This allows the most dominant personalities to dominate decision making. It allows council admin to also control the elected council. To be fair to a council admin, they are there to implement the decisions of an elected member's council. They're not needed to make decisions. But if you have a vacuum and a frustration, they're going to be making decisions. Past councillors were unable to effectively navigate through opposing voting blocks, factional politics, egos and personalities, and divided opinions and conflict at council meetings. It is a skill to be able to deal with that. Most people will be out of their depth. They also didn't have the voting numbers on council to implement the changes needed, so ratepayers and residents alike just end up with exactly the same rot year in, year out. You might say, but we have nine councillors, why can't we get the votes to change things? Because currently, and you can watch the videos at council meetings yourself, you have a voting block of five councillors in council who keep supporting the mayor, the CEO and council administrator agendas and not challenging anything. How do you change this? Through the council elections in November that vacates nine council positions and that of a mayor. What do you need? You need a minimum of five like-minded but independent thinking, knowledgeable, business savvy and experienced new councillors, preferably six. Five will give you a meeting quorum, six will give you a new voting block. Any less, you will not get the changes you want. You, if you get one or two new councillors on council, it means nothing. Think of it as using the same tactics deployed by the current council against the current council to get a better council put in place. But with the current resident dissatisfaction with council, I believe that you could get seven new councillors in, is a distinct possibility. If you add the re-election of the only two current councillors, David Kemp and Andrew Robinson, who have argued for residents and against council accesses, and again, I only know this from watching all the videos of the council meetings, like Peter Charles and Terry Andrews did during their terms of office, you have your new council of nine. What is the key differentiator? Like David and Andrew, these new councillors must bring a mixture of business, finance and service delivery experience, as this council is, after all, a large and complex $34 million business. This skill mix would allow a new council team to more adequately review and, if needed, challenge what the council administration and the CEO submit for decision. Extensive life experience alone is not enough anymore to be an effective councillor. You need business and financial acumen and legislative knowledge. Ideally, these new councillors also need to be independent of any faction or ideology group and not affiliated with any political parties, else you will constantly have a council unable to decide or implement anything. They'll just be fighting internally. You may ask, 
Doesn't council protocol and policies ensure that dominant personalities can't dominate council? Unfortunately not, because the current and previous councils have diluted the legislation procedure framework, and I've gone through and read all their policies against the legislation, put in place by the South Australian Government to ensure that council authority and decision making lies solely with the elected council members. These modifications have led to an overt influence and control of the elected councils by the Mayor, Council CEO and Council Administration. You need a new elected council to get a majority voting block to be able to correct this and I'll explain how. So let's move forward to December. You've got a new council in. Now what? First, you must regain control of council meetings and subcommittees. A new council needs to revise the council's current code of conduct, meetings policy and meeting protocols to realign them back to South Australian legislation and to put controller processes back solely with the elected members. This is a critical framework that council chamber works within. It's an opportunity to remind the council chamber that the mayor and councillors do not have any authority to act or make decisions as individuals. They are members of an elected body that makes decisions on behalf of local residents through a formal meeting process. Ideally, the mayor has, through the change in protocol, is required to follow Robert's rules for meetings, which is followed by every corporate board around the world, including local government and non-profit boards, where, for example, subject matters that the mayor may not want discussed are not allowed to be rushed through, but rather where after each agenda item, the mayor must ask the elected members if anyone has a comment on the matter or wishes to raise a motion or call a division before announcing the next agenda item. All key council policies need to be reviewed and revised, especially the human relations policies and those that impact on council administration staff following directives of the elected member body. And I'll get into that in more detail shortly. Re-establish the correct council chamber practices through the meeting protocols so that the CEO and the mayor is not allowed to participate in nor influence elected member debates nor give advice on matters up before council for decision unless specifically requested by the elected members. Remember the mayor's role besides the ceremonial function, is only to enforce meeting protocols during regular council meetings where councillors debate and vote on motions and manage the conduct of participants at those council meetings. The Mayor has a casting vote only if the voting is tied. That's it. Commenting and participating in elected member debates is not the CEO nor the Mayor's role. There is no legal precedent nor legislative right for the CEO to participate in council discussions on behalf of the Mayor. And I've watched many of the videos where that has actually occurred. However, if you change the meeting protocols to allow that, then it's totally acceptable. It's not the legislation. I would go further by revising both the Mayor and CEO's position descriptions under section, and apologies for getting technical here, section 58 of the Act to enforce this. And if council elected members still get pushback or non-cooperation from the Mayor and CEO, then to amend, amend the council's constitution under section 12 and 58 and chapter seven, part one, subsection 99 of the Local Government Act to achieve this. Remove the CEO from all ordinary and special council meetings unless requested to make a presentation or answer questions from the elected members. Minutes previously taken by the CEO should now be taken by a council secretary instead. All council motions and discussions, questions and answers must be minuted. Currently not everything is recorded. From viewing recent council meeting videos and published minutes, minutes appear to be taken selectively at the discretion of the Mayor and the CEO. Remove the Mayor and the CEO from all council subcommittees and advisory groups. Subcommittee chairs must always be an elected council member. 
limit council staff participation on the subcommittees. There were amendments done last year to the Local Government Act that actually says that local uh, council staff are not allowed on subcommittees at all. But there is a relevance where you can have them participate depending on the subject matter being discussed. Add an external independent third party with relevant subject matter expertise if required to assist and inform elected council members on the subcommittees. Revise the various subcommittee charters and terms of reference to better reflect what they should be doing, not just what the council administration wants them to do. Review and discuss and agree on a model to reorganise the current subcommittees into a more effective arrangement. For example, the audit committee should really be an audit and risk subcommittee. The current council assessment subcommittee should be renamed council application assessment subcommittee to better reflect what it does. As the current name confuses people, implies it assesses the council and not submissions to council. This subcommittee would work with care areas of the council administration to ensure all submissions include risk assessments, full costings, community impact, alternative options. There should be a strategic planning and development advisory subcommittee that would assess funding opportunities, state government grants, corporate philanthropic funding, federal grants, commercial sponsorships. There's a small number of community transport, hospital and disability subcommittees that are really fragmented parts of a broader community services. They should be consolidated into a more appropriate community wellbeing subcommittee like some of the other councils in South Australia. There's a number of separate arts and festival, event and sport focus subcommittees that should be consolidated into a more appropriate city activities and sports subcommittee. There's a number of separate council facility management subcommittees that should be consolidated into a city assets management subcommittee. And lastly, there should be a council advisory subcommittee that reviews community feedback, for example, from heritage groups, local chamber of commerce and business groups, community advocacy groups, Koori groups and so forth. Now that you've re-established control back in the elected member chamber, how do you gain control back over the council administration? It's not that hard. You implement a new set of cascading delegation authorities down through the CEO, because you can't direct the staff, it's got to come from the CEO, but the CEO follows the directions of the elected <coughs> members through the mayor. Severely restricting any amount of money council admin can spend and curtails authority levels to make decision. Make all decisions go back to the elected members for approval and this can be eased back later. It means more work for the elected members or through subcommittees, but that six months initially that you do this, you will get controls of your, all your monies very easily. You implement cascading performance goals and measurable targets, which are called key performance indicators, down through the CEO, down to all department heads and levels of council administration. You implement incentivised performance improvement for council employees. You revise the council HR policy to align with the 2021 Local Government Act Statutes Amendment, Section 19, Subsection 2, to reiterate expected and accepted behaviour by council administration executives, officers and staff, including disciplinary measures, including termination, for non-compliance, willful and passive resistance and belligerent behaviour by council administration, executives, officers and staff. Section 68, Section 109, Subsection 2 of the revised Local uh, Government Act says an employee of council must comply and contravention of or failure to comply of an employee of the council constitutes a ground for suspending dismissing or taking other disciplinary actions against the employee. That's the current legislation, that's law. And that was introduced last year. Implement policy of competency and skill assessment as part of staff reviews. Temporarily suspend any penalties and impacts on council administration by not achieving the current enforced strategic, tactical and operational plans until a revised and reprioritisation has occurred by the new elected council members. You don't want existing council members penalised for not achieving targets 
whilst a temporary operational suspension is underway. And I'll talk more about an operational suspension shortly. You temporarily suspend all of council administration's automatic uh, and salary increases pending review by the newly elected council members with the CEO. You tie salary increases to achieving performance targets only, not automatic. This one is probably the most important. You direct the CEO to review and streamline council administration staff levels and administration costs to find savings to address the council administration operational and budget deficits. All proposed savings, including impact statements, must go to the elected members for review and approval prior to any implementation. You will probably get some council administration executives, officers and staff leave due to these changes, but I would say they're probably more likely part of the problem anyway. So it's not really a loss. What next? You temporarily suspend everything non-critical, including rate increases, until a financial status review of council can be completed. This normally takes three weeks to achieve. I'm talking about from experience with really complex government departments and councils. So this is something that can be done. You still progress any critical community work or anything that impacts community health and safety, including paying, obviously, council staff wages. The new council members need to undertake... They need to do a review to understand the total amount of inherited council debt and Council's actual revenue income and true cost in delivering community services. Often costs are rolled over into another accounting period or hidden amongst various nondescript cost summaries, which makes it hard for a non-accountant to decipher. This financial status review would give the newly elected members better insight as to whether the fiduciary duty, governance compliance and risk mitigation of the Council administration is being adequately managed by the Council CEO. What is the required to do a financial review? You request a plain English executive style summary defined by the elected members, not by the council, from council administration itemising all council debt short and long term borrowing and debt servicing costs. You request a plain English executive style summary, not dissimilar to what boards get, defined by elected members, again, from council administration explaining council's operating costs, deficit areas, financial losses and causes. You request another plain English executive style summary defined by the elected members from council administration itemising all council revenue and income. More importantly, you engage the services of an independent and experienced what's called a forensic analyst accountant to verify what council finance manager and council CEO submits. Then uh, you regain control of all council capital projects and community related major works. You suspend everything non-critical until a review can be completed of all the capital works which normally takes three months. Again you request a plain English executive style summary defined by elected members from council administration of all approved and pending council capital projects and community focused major works. Ensure that all submissions in the summary report have been fully costed, both initial implementation costs and all ongoing costs for the life of the project, alternate options noted, reasons for this project work and community impact if delayed. You hold off making a decision on which of these projects you may go ahead with until the council debt and operating review is completed. Keep in mind that a new council can rescind under legislation anything and everything a previous council has approved, including the budget. However, what a lot of transitional bad councils do and organisations is contract as much as possible in the months leading up to an election so that a new incoming Council inherits maximum debt and pre-allocated financial expenditure. They're locked into contracts that they didn't vote on. In Victoria, for example, councils are not allowed by law to enter into any major 
um, capital work six months prior to an election. It's not the case in South Australia. It relies on councils doing the right thing and not entering into major works before a new council comes in to review that. That doesn't happen here. Next, review and audit the various council auxiliary authorities and boards. The Aquatic Centre has a 712,000 operating deficit. Why? The Horse and Tram Authority has a 300,000 operating deficit. Why? The council's own cinema pre-purchase was making an annual profit of $350,000 a year. Now runs at a loss. Why? The Waste Management Authority has failed to follow EPA regulations and asbestos material from building sites were deposited as residential waste and reprocessed by the Waste Management Authority as road fill and on sold to pro private residents. This did not happen just once. Why? As a result, um, Victor Harbour has a $20 million rectification liability, as does its partner councils have equal amount of money. I would also recommend the newly elected council vote to implement what's called best practice principles within council administration. For example, issue tenders to the market and change council's current legal firm in line with existing council audit policies where auditors are changed every five years. I would recommend changing both the audit and legal to four years to align with council elections. Don't use the LGA's legal services solely, but rather use properly independent qualified legal firms to get council's legal advice going forward. Use that to also validate what the LGA says. Um, you implement proper accounting standards into council. Administration can still report to the LGA and state government using their required accounting standards, but for operational management, only new accounting standards should be used that provide accurate totals and breakdowns for council staff managers. It's hard for them in their departments to get a full understanding of their total costs. Elected council members have no idea of the full extent because how information is presented to them is confusing. And the public, they've got no chance of understanding that. The other thing I would recommend is establishing what is called keep it simple and understandable, key performance indicators, scorecards on the council website so it's viewable by the public. Budget tracking, approved projects completions to be displayed and updated monthly by the CEO and department heads giving more transparency on the CEO and council administration performance to both the elected council members and Victor Harbour community as a whole. Next, look at what quick wins a new council can implement for the community. The current council has wasted many millions of dollars on feasibility studies and concepts that have all been shelved. You can go to the website, you can have a look at all the archived projects in there. That money could have been spent on fixing roads, fixing bike track issues, upgrade facilities of many local clubs along the foreshore, building more bus shelters along roads, building more toilets along the bike track and park areas, funding sheds for the Dragon Boat Club, installing a second boat ramp, install a proper walking track up to the bluff, addressing storm water and flooding issues, and the list goes on. In finishing, um, can I just say, in talking with a lot of ratepayers, when I was 2IC at the state election and at the federal election, I had several weeks to talk to about 4,000 residents in the queues waiting to um, vote. And the majority of ratepayers in Victor Harbour just want council operating costs and debt levels manageable. It's not saying that councils can't or shouldn't have debt. They want council administration streamlined. They believe it's, it's too many staff, uh, not as many as, as Goolwa, which has 300 staff. Here you've got about 133, I believe. They want small and medium capital work projects just done, not continually talked about. And council rates reduced if possible. So hopefully I've shown you that you can get the council you want, and you can manage and control council admin and council debt, and there are many options other than continual rate increases. <laughs>